large distributed genome out there, it can be mobilized between cells, and when a new ecological niche opens up, the, the, the appropriate components of this distributed genome can be assembled within the cell so the cell can exploit the niche. And uh, that process goes on. We know it goes on because we have direct uh, molecular evidence of the transfer events and their consequences and their relationship with the ecology of the bacteria. Uh, there's still a lot we don't know about that and about how active or how passive the cells are in controlling the transfer process itself and in discriminating between what DNA they accept and don't accept. So that, there's still a lot of research to be done there. And then recently, um, in the 90s and uh, in this uh, century, we've begun to learn about horizontal DNA transfer across kingdoms. So symbiogenesis is one way to mix genomes together, uh, but horizontal transfer uh, from uh, endosymbionts to their hosts and from the host to the endosymbionts is an ongoing process. I just talked to a, a colleague of mine who works on Legionella bacteria, which cause Legionella, Legionnaire's disease or Legionella pneumonia. And it turns out that the proteins that Legionella uses to take control of the host cells during infections have been acquired from mammalian sources. They've been picked up. So bacteria can pick up mammalian DNA. We know there is the genome of a whole endosymbiotic bacteria in the, some fruit fly genome. So this kind of transfer goes on all the time, and there are functional things that have been transferred as well. So this was the slide that I thought I had earlier, I'm sorry, uh, to sh show the mismatch, the monitoring mute S protein binding to it, bringing in the mute L and mute H proteins, the mute H cuts the DNA, removes the new strand, and in this case, the bacteria use differential methylation to tell which is the old and which is the new strand. The, D, the, the incorrect DNA is removed, and then DNA is resynthesized so that the right base gets put opposite uh, that uh, template uh, base. So uh, that is, I would argue, a, a cognitive process. Now, All of these things, if we start to look at them, we have this whole array of cell functions, which is what I call natural genetic engineering. And I need to make a, a point before I go into the details about this. Uh, I call it natural genetic engineering because the DNA is being cut and spliced. And I said, well, it's like genetic engineering. And other people actually had used the term uh, before me. Uh, the, the evolutionary biologists and the intelligent design people think of engineering as a, a, a directed process. And that hadn't occurred to me, but I gave a, a seminar at the Santa Fe Institute, and Murray Gelman says, how can you have genetic engineering? You have to have an engineer. And as though this is bringing something forbidden into the process. Uh, and I, I don't think it is forbidden because, as I've said, I think it's like what McClintock was talking about, a process where the cell senses and is in control of what's happening. So all cells have nucleases, polymerases, helicases, these enzymes that unwind DNA, and ligases, the, the, the enzymes that seal them together. There are these lesion bypass mutator polymerases, which are actually responsible for the so-called point mutations which are interpreted as replication errors, but they actually require these polymerases to be in place to happen. There's homologous, or what used to be called legitimate recombination, the kind of recombination that we use for making genetic maps, the kind of recombination that's necessary for cells to go through uh, the two-step uh, process of meiosis. And then there's non-homologous end joining, the, the, the phenomenon that McClintock studied cyto cytogenetically, not molecularly. But then we have site-specific recombination, which as the name implies, involves special recombinases and special recombination sites. 
Uh, it's used to put viruses into chromosomes and take them out. There are structures called integrons, which are little platforms which have a site-specific recombinase to pick up cassettes for protein coding sequences, typically for antibiotic resistance or for other functions. There are super integrons, which are long structures like this, found in the genomes of many bacteria and coding pathogenicity and adherence factors and other functions needed to work as a pathogen. And there are these fascinating things called shufflons, where the recombination takes place inside of the coding sequences, and they're used by the bacteria to modify the structure of the surface proteins so that they can avoid the immune system or interact with different cell types. There's a whole variety of mobile gene genetic elements, the things that McClintock studied. There are ones that work at the level of DNA, called DNA transposons. There are ones that are like retroviruses. Remember, HIV, when it infects, goes into a chromosome. It's reverse transcribed into DNA and inserted into the chromosome. And there are retrotransposons, things which can't make virus particles, but can move from place to place within the genome that have a similar structure. And uh, uh, those are uh, very frequent. And then there are other kinds of retrotransposons called non-LTR. They don't have this characteristic LTR structure on the ends that the retroviruses have. Uh, and they're very <coughs> abundant in some organisms. They're our most abundant form of DNA <coughs> in genomes, as we'll see in a second. And, uh, of course, there, the, the variety of mechanisms that are involved, even within the DNA transposons, is quite amazing. And what you should do is just realize that these are mobile cassettes, which can be uh, clicked into the genome at different places. And that we understand the molecular biology down to the, 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 the phosphodiester bond level. And that these uh, elements have been used in evolution repeatedly. Uh, there was a paper published at the end of last year where the number of elements in the human genome that can be traced back to mobile elements is now over 280,000. Uh, if you compare the genetic differences between eutherian mammals and marsupials, over 20% of those are due to mobile elements which have then been modified and accepted or used for new function. So these cassettes can move around the genome and when they do that, they carry lots of, of regulatory and, and control information with them. There are introns which can uh, reinsert back in the uh, uh, original site, both by, at the DNA level and some of them at the RNA level. They can reverse splice into the, R, to the DNA. There are these things called intines, which are self-splicing protein segments, which in, when they're spliced out become a nuclease, which can cut the DNA so that the DNA that encodes can be inserted. <coughs> There are these things called diversity generating retro elements that were found in, in uh, bacteria uh, about five years ago. And then there are these things called CRISPRs in bacteria and PI RNA loci in animals, which are systems for picking up fragments of invading DNA, incorporating it into the genome and using it to generate resistance to new infections by those agents. And here's a picture of, of a, a CRISPR. This is a CRISPR which was picked up uh, by bioinformatics in, around the turn of the century because it had these inverted repeats. And so this is a, a, a CRISPR is a clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. And these diamonds indicate the inverted repeats. But the business end is actually these spacer regions, which it turns out contain sequences from viruses and transposons and plasmids and other invading DNA molecules. And you and I have them, plants have them, uh, in somewhat different form. They don't use the CRISPR. 
And these uh, uh, CRISPRs are then transcribed to make sh short RNAs, which block the activity and the replication of the invading DNA. This has been called a bacterial genome immune system. It's a form of memory of what's happened in the past. Uh, it uh, uh, does what was said to be impossible on the basis of the luria delbruck experiment, that is, a virus infection could not induce resistance, but it does. Uh, the reason that it didn't happen in their experiments was because of the nature of the virus that they used and the way it kills the cells. And then there are all these functions associated with them which people are studying and figuring out how they actually work in this whole system. Uh, we understand, I think, pretty well how the system works to in inactivate the invaders. That's a kind of RNA interference process which has been uh, well studied. How they actually pick up the DNA fragments to put into the CRISPRs so they can make the interfering RNAs is still, to my knowledge, not worked out, but uh, I may just be ignorant of the latest research. Um, and um, uh, again, this is a form of cognition. Uh, know yourself, know your enemy, a thousand victories. A thousand battles, a thousand victories. That I think was Sun Tzu who said that. Uh, if we look at our own genome, we find that it's full of these different mobile elements. There's a lot of heat uh, in the press, in the blogosphere, about this now because uh, these repeats, um, well, let me go, go over first what the repeats are. There are DNA transposons, or deleted defective versions of them, and they make up about 3% of our genome, there's 300,000 copies. There are retrovirus-like elements, which have these long terminal repeats, and these are related to the endogenous retroviruses, I said, were involved in placental evolution. And there are shorter versions of them which lack some of the functions needed to be a virus, but they can still move from place to place. And there's about a half, 450,000 of those, and they make up 8% of, of the genome. And then there's this, this other class of retrotransposon line elements and sign elements, which use a different, very non-discriminatory mechanism of, trans, of retrotransposition. And they make up 34% uh, of the draft human genome in 2000 <coughs> and, and, and one. So they're all over the place. They all carry splicing signals, promoters, transcription signals. They affect the behavior of the genome in a multitude of ways. Uh, and uh, the argument now is whether these are functional or, or just junk DNA. Uh, I think the junk idea is going to be junked. Uh, but the people who favor it are fighting back ferociously and trying to parse the new evidence that came out last week. Uh, or it was last week, yeah. yes. from the ENCODE project uh, uh, about this. Uh, about how, how many of these uh, elements that are bind transcription factors are involved in regulation, are involved in genetic disease, uh, and are transcribed into RNA. Uh, so now, let's go a little bit further uh, and come back to McClintock's idea about the response of the genome or the cell to challenge. And what we know is that there are many different kinds of stimuli which alter both epigenetic control of natural genetic engineering, that is, for example, the epigenetic modifications which keep all of these elements in our genome silent and from moving all around and filling up our genome with too much DNA. Uh, so they're put into silent chromatin in an RNA-directed fashion by these RNAs that are like the CRISPRs in bacteria. Uh, so, so a series of different kinds of stimuli can alter that kind of control. And at the same time, it can elevate genome variability. So McClintock studied chromosome breaks. We know that pheromones, hormones, and cytokines 
can turn on these elements, sometimes in quite specific fashion, sometimes in a more general one. Starvation, which is one that I studied, and I'll show you an experiment in a minute. DNA damage, telomere erosion, antibiotics, phenolics, osmolites, oxidants, all kinds of noxious compounds, pressure, temperature, wounding, protoplasting and growth in tissue culture, uh, putting cells in unusual situations uh, tends to destabilize both their epigenetic regulation and their genome stability. Infection by bacteria or fungus uh, or virus, I should, I should have added in there. And also, very importantly, changes in ploidy, that is in the number of copies of the genome within the cell. Uh, and DNA content, uh, and there are lots of evidence in the, in the genome record of what's called whole genome doubling, doubling the content of the genome at critical stages of evolution. So for example, at the root of vertebrate evolution, there was a whole genome duplication. And that was followed by the separation of jawed vertebrates from jawless vertebrates another whole genome duplication. So those were sudden events because the genome duplication events are single generation events which are associated with major transitions in evolution. <coughs> and finally, we know that hybridization, matings between un unrelated uh, uh, individuals who do not normally mate with each other, destabilize both the epigenetic control and uh, lead to genome instability. Also typically lead to genome doubling as well. 25% uh, of Arabidopsis hybrids in one experiment spontaneously duplicated their whole genomes. And that allows them to be fertile and to reproduce. Um, and um, uh, I've lost my, my, my train of thought now. I wanted to make one more point about this. Uh, but we'll see if we come back to this. The changes in ploidy and in, 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 in the hybridization events uh, are, uh, well, we'll come back to it, but these are life history events which stimulate genetic change and uh, almost certainly play a critical role in evolutionary transitions. It's not the slow accumulation of mutations, but it's these rapid events which lead to rapid uh, genome change. So the experiment that I did, I was studying a very complex DNA rearrangement, which would fuse together two coding sequences, which could not be expressed, uh, and had a transposable element in between them. And this was a technique devised by my colleague, Malcolm Casadabad, to fuse any protein coding sequence to beta-galactosidase LACZ sequence so that you could use LACZ to study it in bacteria. And a, a former postdoc of mine had used this technique and told me that it took a long time. You had to use thick plates because it took a long time to happen. And I said, that's really fascinating. You should study that. And after two years of telling him and not getting a response, I finally did it myself. And what happens is, when you played out the bacteria initially, in the first four or five days, no colonies come up. Now, you can do reconstruction experiments to show if even at a very low level, there had been fusions in the population, they would have made a colony within two days. So the fusion never occurred during normal growth. However, after a certain period of time, which can differ from plate to plate, all of a sudden, the plates develop zits and fill up with colonies, and they become saturated with two or 300 colonies. That doesn't mean that that's the limit of how many fusions are formed, because those colonies use up all the resources and prevent other colonies from growing. I calculated that at the minimum, there is a 100,000-fold increase in the frequency of these events. I mean, I couldn't calculate what it was actually because I couldn't measure the events under normal conditions. But this is starvation, aerobic starvation, uh, uh, which uh, stimulates the, this particular 
coding sequence uh, fusion. And I think that's a pretty remarkable case. It certainly impressed the hell out of me, uh, and it's influenced my views uh, ever, ever since. Um, I, I added this slide. I didn't have it in originally, but I think I'm, uh, well, I'm getting, going a little long on my time, so let me speed up a little bit. I just wanted to point out to you that, that not only uh, are natural genetic engineering events triggered by life history experiences, but cells are capable of targeting natural genetic engineering within the genome. I've got a whole bunch of examples listed here. I hope you'll just take my word for it that it can happen. The one I, I, I like to use as a, as a specific illustration is taken from the immune system where you have DNA joining to, to make the variable region sequence, which is what contributes to the antibody, uh, part of the antibody that recognizes an antigen. And then you have the constant region, which is what determines how the antibody interacts with the rest of the body. So once the cell has selected and modified by localized mutagenesis, the antigen binding specificity, it needs to change where they direct that antibody, where, the, where that antibody goes in the body. And that's done by making double strand breaks at these switch regions called S, the downstream of the variable region exon and upstream of these other constant region exons. Now the interesting thing about how these switches occur is they occur when the S region is transcribed this S region is transcribed because the antibody is being produced. <coughs> These S regions are transcribed because different signals from other cells in the immune system, what are called lymphokines, can activate transcription and tell the antibody producing cell which constant region exon to add on to the antibody. So cell to cell signaling can inform a cell of a specific targeting, a specific DNA rearrangement. And there's nothing mysterious about any of these targeting processes at the molecular level. They all involve fairly well understood or, or certainly plausible molecular mechanisms, but uh, that capability is there. And we really don't know how far that capability is used in, in evolution. So, um, uh, Again, let me uh, go faster through this to say that there's lots of evidence for abrupt events of natural genetic engineering in evolution. Um, uh, uh, new, uh, well, uh, mobile elements, for example, are, are distributed around the genome and become functional elements and help establish networks in the genome, part of the genome being an organized system. There are horizontal transfers, whole genome duplications, and so forth. Uh, and uh, so let me tell you how I think cognition works in evolution and how ecological disruption, which might bring us back to the, the, the ecology and the, the, the larger picture, uh, can influence epigenetic regulation and natural genetic engineering uh, processes. If there are, if a, a major ecological disruption occurs, there will be changes in population structure, and in particular populations will drop in size. There will be changes in food sources, which may lead to starvation. Uh, there will be various adaptive needs, which go unmet. And in particular, organismal behavior and infectious agents will have to seek out new hosts and partners. So it, depleting the population means you're not going to find a normal mate. Oh, so you mate with somebody who looks similar. You have a hybridization event. And boom, you've set off a deep genome destabilizing event and started the natural genetic uh, engineering process going. Now, Macroevolution uh, can be triggered by starvation, cell fusions, uh, interspecific hybridizations, symbiogenesis, 
episodes of horizontal transfer genome re rearrangements and novel symbiotic uh, associations. And uh, these uh, events in the disrupted ecology uh, may produce some novelties. And uh, they will certainly establish new cell and genome system architectures on the analogy of a computer system architecture. And there will be complex novelties uh, arising from whole genome duplications where everything is duplicated so you can change things without losing the function. Uh, and you may get some pretty sophisticated or complex novelties out of that. Now, they may not work very well. But remember, we're in ecological crisis. Selection and competition will not be as intense as they would be in a normal ecology. So the organisms with useful adaptive traits will be able to survive and proliferate in the depleted ecology. The non-functional novelties will be eliminated. Selection will be largely a purifying force. And then as time goes on and the ecology begins to fill up, <coughs> microevolutionary processes can take place to fine tune the novelties that were created in these bursts of evolutionary change. And, and that, in fact, is what happens in the immune system. You, you make the antigen binding sites. Once they work, you then specifically mutagenize them to refine their uh, antigen binding ability. So that's why I say immune system model. So what are the research challenges uh, ahead? And this is my last slide. What we know is that genomes are organized systemically, no matter what the junk DNA people would like to believe. Cells operate cognitively, and I'm trying to give you some examples of what I mean by that. Cells can activate <coughs> natural genetic engineering agents and evolutionary change of read-write genomes. And cells have the tools to control and target natural genetic engineering processes. So that, all of that is, is, is unquestioned science, although a lot of people will say, well, it's not important. It seems to me it's pretty different from the way I was taught about how genetic change took place. Now, what do we need to learn uh, how to do? And uh, the first thing is, and I'm hoping I can convince a former postdoc to do the experiments is we need to learn how to observe network evolution in real time. Go beyond single changes to network changes to ask, are cells capable of coordinating multiple DNA restructuring events in a useful way throughout the genome? And that may or may not happen, but it's a matter of empirical investigation. And the one thing I learned from my fusion experiments with starvation was you have to use thick plates and hold them for a long time in order to see whether the thing will work. Uh, once we can do that, if we can, we may be able to ask, can we influence complex evolutionary events by sensory inputs? And there are a number of ways we could think about doing that. Uh, you couldn't get funded to do that now. Uh, hopefully in a few years you will be able to be funded to do that. Uh, but those will be fascinating experiments. And I, I think that the most important thing is how do these molecular networks and cells do the decision making and the cognitive work that they indisputably carry out that is, we need to develop a real science of cell cognition. And I think that will clarify a lot of problems in, in biology. 